there you go. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Can you see the, the screen again? My, my screen yes. again? Yes. Yeah, that's perfect then. Um, well, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I'm really glad I can speak about that. And um, so, yeah, today I'm just going to, to talk about so what's, what's in front of you, so around the theorem of Lagarius. So um, my point is just in the first, um, no, it's not going to, okay. So my point is just uh, going in the first, um, in the first part to introduce like kind of a gent kind of like gently the, uh, the objects I want to work with, uh, try to speak a bit generally and maybe historically about what's uh, uh, what we're interested in um, and particularly try to present what this uh, theorem of Lagaya says um, and then once I, I uh, once I do that I try to talk about uh, extensions so what do I hit uh, I, I understand by extensions um, so in the first part, we'll be focused mainly with something that happens in Euclidean spaces. Uh, and in the next part, we'll try to first extend it to something like more general in, in general amenable groups. And um, third part in, well, actually going even beyond uh, amenable groups in uh, SLNR. Uh, oh. No. So, yeah. Um, so the, the point is, um, what I'm going to try to show is that the, this is a problem really interesting with the, a, a really, really uh, interesting interaction of, of kind of three things, which is uh, additive combinatorics, um, some geometry uh, to, some, to some extent, and some ergodic theory, and uh, try to see how, how all these things kind of interact. Um, okay, so... So let's uh, let's maybe just get into into the definitions of these Delaunay sets and Mayer sets. Okay, so a Delaunay set is something really simple. Actually, it's just um, it's just uh, it's just the following. So you have x. So this should be a big x, I guess. Um, and you're going to ask two things. It's going to be uniformly discrete and relatively dense. So what does that mean? Uniformly discrete. So you give a small r, and it's r uniformly discrete if any two points are apart from at least r, as long as they're not equal. Um, so what you, you ask is like some sort of like yeah, quantitative notion of discreteness. Um, relatively dense, well, um, you're going to ask that. So if you're, if you're more on the group theory side, what you want uh, to have in mind is that x is somehow co-compact, uh, meaning that uh, if I take any point in Rn, it's within distance big R of my set of points, uh, 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 big X. Okay, so my set in some sense, in some sense, is discrete, but it's well spread. Like it, it does, it's well spread around, uh, in and around uh, R N, and that's that's the re really the kind of of, the, of sets I want to 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 consider. So let's let's see a bit why there's what kind of geometry we're going to be to, to be looking at uh, for this set. And they come from what we call usually tilings. Um, so the picture you have in front of you, obviously it's not a Delaunay set. It's not like it's what, what Delaunay set are we considering here? The Delaunay set we're considering is just the set of the vertices. So you have all the triangles that kind of like all lots of, tri of triangles that tile your plane. Um, and you're looking at the Delaunay set, which is formed by um, the vertices of these, of these triangles. Okay, so the, the image I have uh, here is a really interesting uh, tiling. It's called the pinwheel tiling. And what's interesting about it, it essentially it's made, uh, so this tiling is made thanks to only one type of triangle. So all the triangles you see on this picture, so actually if you could zoom, you could see that within these big tri black triangles, you have little gray triangles. So all these little gray tri triangles have the same, the same angles. So they are just like rotations of one another. And so it's really nice, but it's not quite uh, what we want to study. So what we want to study is like slightly more regular than that. Um, and so it's, it's more uh, the, um, the, the, the kind of tilings on so the Lenny sets that arise from the tilings that come from a pen, the, the Pendor styling P3. Um, so you're going to ask probably what's the difference between these two. So there's a, ma a major difference. Um, so you can see here, I have two colors for the two types of tiles, uh, a light blue and a, and a, and a darker blue. 
um, the point is these uh, both the light blue and the dark blue appear in only finitely many orientations. Whereas on the pinwheel, pinwheel tiling, you have one triangle, but it appears in, a, in infinitely many orientations. Um, so um, while the Penrose tiling P3 is really tiled thanks to only finitely, really only finitely many, many tiles, the pinwheel, pinwheel tiling is not really uh, like that. You have one triangle, yes, but it rotates a lot. So it's not, it's not as nice. So we're, we're more going to consider this kind of like, this, this second example of something with only really finitely many tiles. Um, so how do I characterize that like more algebraically? Because I, I, I want to look at things a bit more algebraically. Uh, so that's that's what we call a, a, set, a Delaunay set of finite type. And that's what we're going to be interested in. Um, so X, a Delaunay set is of finite type if it satisfies the following. X minus, minus X, so by that I mean the Min Minkowski difference, so all the, the set of all the differences between two elements of X, so the set of all the X1 minus X2. Uh, so it is a finite type if this set intersected with any ball of any size is finite. Uh, so obviously, yeah, so it's finite, and so that's what we call X minus y. X is locally finite. And uh, just because, yeah, at any local uh, kind of like scale, you're going to see only a finite number of points. Um, and 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 it's it's great because this uh, this condition, this algebraic condition, actually says one thing and really only one thing. Um, X is a Delaunay set of finite type if and only if X is the set of vertices of some tiling of the look, of of R n with finitely many tiles up to translation. Okay, so we are really describing the thing we were, we were we were talking about. So we have we are related to this notion of like tilings, but only with finitely many tiles. Okay, so that's that's good. Um, but in fact, that's not all. So this Penrose P three uh, tiling P three are actually slightly more regular than just of finite type, and that's that's what I'm going to to introduce now. It's the the the, the notion of of Meyer sets. Okay, so a Meyer set. Um, is, is defined like that. So it's defined Meyer from uh, Yves Meyer, who was one of the first to really study them um, in 72. Um, so Meyer set is kind of like a strengthening of this Delaunay set of finite type. And um, it is, so obviously we start with the Delaunay set as always, um, but you ask something a bit really, really strong on the, uh, on the Minkowski difference, uh, which is that there is some F finite such that Lambda minus lambda is contained in F plus lambda. Um, you can think about it, and it's going to be useful later in the analogies we're going to do, as uh, the Minkowski difference of lambda is not much bigger or not, yeah, not much bigger than lambda itself. So if you if you look at the differences, you don't have much more complexity than you had already in lambda. So it's uh, it's like that that you might want to think about it, um, and uh, so a few examples of Meyer sets because we're going to try to to to, to think about them. Um, the, the 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 initial example and kind of like the, the the most perfect example you can think of is really the set of integer points in R n. Obviously, if lambda is equal to z to the n, lambda minus lambda is just lambda itself. And lambda is obviously a Delaunay set, so you're you're fine. Um, the other example is the one I, I had already um, already mentioned above. Uh, it's the set of vertices of the Penrose tiling. It's not completely. It's not really obvious to see, and it was first observed. So I should have like uh, noted the name here by De Bruyne. Uh, I don't. I think it's seventy, like maybe seventy three or something. Uh, but I'm I'm not completely sure. So it should be somewhere here. Um, and another another uh, another example of a slightly different flavor, actually number theoretic flavor that I'm not going to be talking about uh, a lot today, but I want to mention because it's it's I think really interesting and appears quite naturally, um, is the set of piso vijoria gavan numbers of some real number field. So you have something. So piso the piso numbers can be seen as some. Um, yeah, approximate generalization of, of, of uh, integers, if you want. 
they are really interesting sets of the number of, of uh, the rules that are the learning sets and satisfy lots of really interesting algebraic conditions. Uh, and they appear naturally as examples of major sets. Um, so just to, to highlight the fact that these major sets do exist, we're not looking at something that's completely random and, and they have interesting, they come from interesting places and different places. Um, okay, so what's, what's the theorem of Lagarias? What, what does it say? Uh, the theorem of Lagarias actually tells you that these major sets are characterized by something slightly, slightly that appears to be slightly weaker than the definition of uh, or the initial definition of Meyer. Um, so Lagarde set tells you that if you want to be a Meyer set, you really on, only need two conditions. First, that you're relatively dense. And second, that lambda minus lambda is uniformly discrete. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so, so if you want to understand, I, I won't go, run into, yeah, go, go into details too much, but if you want to understand what this lambda minus lambda is uniformly discrete means in terms of like tilings or stuff, uh, what that really means is, is about like how the different uh, patterns uh, or patches of your tilings, uh, of the tilings that you see uh, behave. And the fact that they are kind of like well, well, you have only finitely many of them and they're well separated from one another. So there's a geometric uh, uh, kind of like intuition be behind this, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to, to explain it too much. What I'm going to explain though, is that Lagarde's theorem, and it, it was actually the, the motivation for, uh, of Lagarde's, gives you some sort of, of hierarchy among the, the learning sets. Uh, hierarchy that is like, based on really just these uh, algebraic conditions, like algebraic and geometric conditions on lambda minus lambda. Okay, so, so what's, what is this hierarchy? So first, the most general, um, it's just the, the Delaunay sets. Delaunay sets are extremely general. It's really easy to just like put one point in every box, uh, in every box in your uh, RN. So, it's quite a general thing, and if you don't add any any um, any uh, conditions, well, it's a bit too general to really consider. Not that you still have really interesting things that are the linear sets and that are not uh, the two of the uh, uh, the two of the uh, in the two of the categories. Uh, and I mentioned the pinwheel tiling, for instance. Um, if you want to be slightly slightly more uh, regular you have the Delaunay sets of finite type. Uh, so once again, it's just the same thing as saying that lambda minus lambda is locally finite, or saying that you come from a tiling with finitely many tiles up to translation. Um, okay, and the third thing is essentially to say that your major set, or, well, essentially you just like, like you've done the next thing in terms of how discrete lambda minus lambda is, you went from locally finite to uniformly discrete. It's really like the next kind of the next step uh, in terms of like how uh, how discrete it is. Okay, um, so let's let's we won't well we will actually prove like a yes theorem or actually like just make a uh, a quick like uh, I, I, a quick sketch of the, of the proof. But let's let's just start with the baby case, which was uh, kind of like the first observation. Uh, in this in this line of, of theorems, and it, which is due to to Meyer himself when he first studied uh, the Meyer set. Um, okay, so so what I'm saying here, baby case of Lagarde's theorem. So if you have that lambda is relatively dense and lambda minus lambda minus lambda, so I add one is locally finite, uh, then lambda is a Meyer set. Um, so I'm just saying that this is equivalent to the two other conditions that are in Meyer in, in uh, Lagarde's theorem. Um, so how do you prove that? It's actually quite easy, uh, but it's a great observation. So, uh, well, lambda is R relatively dense for some R. So which means that any point is within distance R of, of lambda, any point of Rn. 
Um, so what, what can I do? Well, if I take any two elements, lambda one and lambda two in lambda, I can, I can find some lambda three such that, well, lambda one minus lambda two is within distance r of lambda three. That's just using the fact that lambda is uh, r relatively dense and that lambda one minus lambda two is an element. Um, but what have I just said? Well, essentially what I've said is that this big thing, this lambda one minus lambda two minus lambda three is contained in this intersection. So it's in the ball of radius r and center dot zero, which is compact or well, it's a ball. And this lambda minus lambda minus lambda. Okay, so quite simple, but, but what you know now, well, lambda minus lambda minus lambda is locally finite. So you've just said that this kind of like weird difference is somewhere in a finite set. Okay, so if you call f this finite set, well, you've just said essentially, if you just now put lambda three on the on the other side, that lambda minus lambda is somewhere is is contained in f plus uh, lambda, and you've shown that it's a major set. Okay, so it's 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 quite simple. It's a it's a it's a simple proof, uh, but it's I I I find that it's quite a nice uh, thing to see, and it kind of gives you um a reason for looking for these kind of theorems like it's you, you can do that can you do any better uh, and that's what we're going to consider now uh okay so so maybe to 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 justify a bit all of that the question is why do you care about uh well why, why do you care about such or such sets being major sets why why would you care about that um the reason maybe is is due to a theorem of uh, is, is a theorem to due to um, to Meyer, and we are just going to to kind of try to build like an intuition around it and and explain its its uh, its statement. Um, so let's let's go back to a, to our first uh, example of a Meyer set. So the first example was I have this styling Penrose styling P three. Uh, I think it's also called the kite and darts uh, tiling. Um, and so it's it's just the set of vertices of all the polygons that you see on your screen. Well, you can imagine that it well expands to the whole plane. Um, well, so here I have only two colors, uh, one for each shape. Actually, these shapes are rotated, and it's slightly nicer to have shades depending on how, how what what orientation they're in. And this gives you this picture. So I'm sorry, I made it a bit too small, so it's not as easy to see. Uh, but now you can see that. So you have white for the large, uh, the large tile, and and green for the small ones. And and the white is actually a gray, and it's in different shades uh, depending on how it's uh, on on its orientation. Same for the green. What you should what, what people usually feel when they look at that is that there's some sort of like maybe perspective or something going on. Uh, okay, it hints at actually what Mayer theorem says, which is there's like other dimensions that are coming into, into, into uh, the act actually. And, um, and, uh, and that's, that's what Mayer theorem will, will really specify. But I mean, this, this picture is really fine, but I, you kind of feel that there's some sort of perspective, but it's not clear really what, where it comes from. And I think if you take a slightly simpler, uh, a slightly simpler tiling, you'd see it more. And that's the one we're going to look at now. Um, if you look at this tiling, you should see that we're in three dimensions and not actually in two. We are looking at cubes somewhere in, in 3D and not really at a tiling of the plane, okay? Um, how do you obtain this picture? So this picture is obtained in a really nice way. You take, uh, you look at, at the cubes that tile your, your three-dimensional space, just the cubes with, with the integer uh, coordinate corners. Uh, and you take, let's say an irrational plane in your three-dimensional space. Well, what you do is you look at all the faces of the cubes that intersect this uh, irrational plane. And you just project all these faces on this irrational plane, and you obtain this picture. And so that's why there's some sort of, of uh, perspective uh, going on, and that's actually 
exactly what Meyer, Meyer's theorem says. It says that all Meyer sets are obtained in this way, are obtained in this in this fashion. And so let's let's just uh, state it uh, like a bit more precisely. So if I have lambda a, my, a Meyer set in Rn, uh, then what am I going to be able to do? I'm going to be able to go in higher dimensions. So what I do is I'd be able to find a lattice, so a discrete and co-compact subgroup, typically a Z uh, to the, well, typically the integer coordinate points, uh, a lattice in Rn times Rn, um, such that lambda is actually contained, in fact, it's a bit more precise than that, but let's say, Lambda is roughly equal to, to, to this big thing. So what is this big thing? Um, it's the projection to Rn of this other big but slightly smaller thing. And uh, this slightly smaller thing is what? So you have your, your, your lattice gamma in Rn times Rm. And so you can see Rn as like some, some subgroup of Rn time, times Rm. And you can look at all the points of, of gamma that are, well, yeah, that are around your factor Rn. You can look at all the points of gamma, cut a strip of the points of gamma that are along this Rn factor, and then project it to, uh, to Rn. And that's, what's, that's, what actually, uh, that's what you're actually doing. Um, essentially, if you just want to go back to this picture, picture B, Above what you've done is just you, you looked at well cubes in some higher space dimensional space, took a well space of lower dimension and like just looked at the intersection of all the faces and, and projected it. Uh, essentially, that's that's what it says. Um, so yeah, just well, just to 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 make it really precise, co-compact means that the quotient is compact. Uh, this this big set this big ugly set is called a model set because that's really what you want to think about when you think about mayor sets um, and well we we have built something that is a mayor set too so it satisfies the same algebraic conditions so your what what you're really saying is that lambda is is, is roughly of, of this shape um, and Really interesting is that it's quite easy to see when you're building something that's not periodic. By, by not periodic, I just mean that the set is not stable by any translation or anything. And it's like it's it's when so I said gamma is irrational. Uh, essentially, it's when gamma like the intersection of gamma with R M is um, is uh, is is trivial. Um, so that's that's kind of. Uh, well, that, that's Mayer's theorem, and it's it's uh, relatively easy to to prove. And um, but it's just yeah, it's just a, a great theorem, and it had like amazing like well, it's it's really a cornerstone in uh, in a periodic order. Um, what, what can you say about M? Oh, the small M. Um, you can actually say quite a lot. Uh, I'll. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll come back to that uh, to that question later. But essentially, so you can link this small m quantitatively to the small r and and big r uh, that appear in the Delony uh, definition of of uh, well in how Delony lambda is. We'll we'll see we'll see actually like in in a few slides how you link the two. Um, okay. Um, so now we're going to want to to move forward. And and uh, and um, and generalize um, and generalize so generalize a bit all this theory and go to like maybe amenable groups and maybe even 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 further than that because um, understanding these uh, these sets that are periodic but still quite I don't know quite regular is uh, is quite a challenge. Uh, quite fun and quite interesting, uh, like beyond uh, just the the the, uh, the Euclidean spaces. And I'm just saying that now. But even in Euclidean spaces, there are lots of challenges around that. Obviously, that are absolutely like yeah, seem to be absolutely yeah, insane and and difficult to to solve. Um, so, what's what's going to be our set uh, our setup or our setting? What's what's what what is our framework? What where do we want to work? So. We're going to start with something quite general, 
just take a locally compact group. Um, the ones I like to think about are more like Lie groups on the Lie groups kind of things, linear groups. So you can think of GLNR uh, of Lie groups or QP, even QP is quite fun, um, or like GLNQP or anything that's kind of a linear group or something like that. So yeah, your favorite uh, locally compact or Lie group or anything. Um, and you take so you 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 can always do that. It's not like a third, like an additional condition. It's just I just name it so that it's easier. But you you just take now like a proper compatible distance d, uh, which that is left invariant. Okay. So what you're doing now is just like your you have a topology on g, and you're just saying that this this topology comes from a metric, and you can always do that. It's not it's nothing really. Uh, yeah. Um, so then, well. Extending the notion of Delaunay sets in that in that uh, set setup is uh, is really not uh, nothing too difficult. Uh, a Delaunay set is what? Well, a Delaunay set is something that's uniformly discrete. Well, uniformly discrete. Oh, there's too many lambda ones. Um, uh, so it's a lambda one and a lambda two because yeah, and uh, uh, and so they're supposed to be. So as soon as you have lambda one, which is different from lambda two, um, then these two points in lambda, then these two points are going to be apart by at least distance r. So they're, they're quite far from each other. So once again, you, you look at this picture as something really, really discrete. Um, and again, it's relatively dense. So, um, so you have, um, yeah, you have your, uh, that, that any g in g is within distance r, well, this big r of, of lambda, okay? And uh, that's what I call relatively dense. Okay. Another really interesting uh, definition we're going to to use, and actually, like, if you want to, yeah, we're going to use is the notion of approximate subgroups, which is due to, well, first was really well, was studied before that, but was coined by uh, Tao. Um, um, and well, so what's a K approximate subgroup? A K approximate subgroup is just something that's going to behave approximately like a subgroup. Okay, that doesn't say much, but uh, maybe that's, that will uh, clarify the definition a bit. So what, what does that mean to behave approximately like a subgroup? Well, we're just going to assume, uh, usually when, you are in, when you're abelian, you don't assume that, but since we're taking general G, it's like easier to assume some symmetry. So this symmetry just means that you have uh, the identity that belongs to lambda and that you have uh, lambda minus one, which is equal to lambda. So all like the inverses of your elements are also in your set. Um, but that's, that's not really enough because that's just a symmetric set. And so you're going to ask that it's, it's almost stable when you take products. Um, so what do I mean by that? It means that I'm going to be able to find a finite set G, which is uh, smaller than K in size. Uh, so that's where my K approximate subgroup is. You, try, you, you, you want something that's kind of quantitative. So you, you want to keep track of this kind of data. Um, and you're going to ask that, that lambda squared which is just the set of products. So we are all like still taking things like the Minkowski sum or Minkowski product or Minkowski difference. So that lambda squared is contained in F times lambda. Um, so what does that mean? It means that if you take products in lambda, maybe you're going to, to fail to stay in lambda. Maybe you're going to escape to some extent. Uh, but how much you fail or how much you, ex you escape is, is controlled by this finite set and the size of which is controlled by, by this uh, quantity K, okay? So you have something that's approximately a subgroup, really. Um, so so what, you'd what you'd like to say and what you can, you can do uh, is just say, okay, I'm going to define male sets. Actually, they're called uniform approximate lattices. Uh, in my locally compact group. And they're just going to be Delaunay sets that are approximate subgroups. And that's a perfectly fine definition. Uh, and, that's, and that's absolutely great. And it's like lots of really interesting questions about that. Um, I'm just going to be slightly more, yeah, slightly more general. Okay, so I, I've kept the uniform here, but 
try to forget about it. It's not supposed to be here. Um, I'm going to be slightly more general than that because, well, when you study, for instance, lattices or, or, or stuff like that, when you escape kind of like the realm of, of, of abelian groups, then considering things that are only co-compact is really interesting, but it's kind of like you, you miss certain really interesting objects. So we're going to, to, to be slightly more general than that. And so I'm going to call an approximate lattice. Yeah, just forget about this uniform. I'm going to call an approximate lattice uh, something that's an approximate subgroup of a uh, containing locally compact group that is uniformly discrete. And instead of being co-compact or relatively dense, I'm going to ask something of finite covolume. Um, what do I mean? Essentially, I just mean that I will be able to find omega that's a, a set of finite Haar measure in my, in my locally compact group G, such that omega lambda is equal to G. Okay, so, well, it's not co-compact, it's co-finite volume. So you can, uh, you can see, that, like, see it like that. Um, and these sets are really interesting. So I've, th there's two sets of names uh, near the definition. Uh, first set is uh, Björk and Hartnick, because they were the first to really study, let's say, systematically, the notion of, of um, approximate lattices, but they didn't use this, this definition specifically. They, they use slightly different definitions that we, well, I might speak about a bit later. Um, this definition here was, uh, let's say, systematically studied for the first time by Ryshovsky uh, quite recently. And he showed that, so Bjorklund and Hartnick used to so study definitions, uh, notions of approximate lattices that are slightly stronger than that. And Ryshovsky showed that actually this notion is already quite, uh, well, is already sufficient to, to, to find really interesting results in like lots of groups, okay? Um, okay, so, so that's why there are two sets of names uh, near this, uh, like on top of, uh, of this definition. Um, so what are the kind of questions we're going to ask? Because that's, that's really what matters here. So, well, we've, I've stated two theorems. So you have essentially two questions. Um, the first question uh, uh, is, can you generalize Mayer's theorem? Uh, so it's a question that was first proved by Bjorklund and Hartnick uh, in the same paper where they defined this slightly stronger notion of approximate lattices. Um, and it's frankly like, well, I, I find, I mean, I, I've, Done my PhD thesis on the, on this question, so I find it fascinating, and I hope it's fascinating to other people. Um, and yeah, frankly, it's it's quite fun. You have like it, well, I mean, depending on the groups you're looking at, it's it's just like completely different kinds of theories and or, or, or tools, and that makes it like a really fascinating problem. Um, but I'm not going to really talk about that today. Uh, what I'm interested in is Lagarde's theorem, so generalizing Lagarde's theorem. Uh, why? It's because, well, essentially, I've been looking for the past years about like these approximate lattices, and I'd want to know when, well, to have a criterion or something that tells me when some subset is an approximate lattice. Because, I mean, if you're looking at them, you might as well try to understand when they, where they appear, uh, how easy is it for, for them to appear, and what are the, the conditions that, that make them like, arise, really. Um, so I, 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 that's why this, this question is slightly, slightly more specific than, than the, the ones that, that's above. Um, and so, so I'm going to state it like that. If lambda has finite covolume, so let's say, for instance, this notion of finite covolume, and lambda minus one times lambda is uniformly discrete, is lambda, so is lambda an approximate lattice? Um, so I've, I've stated it with lambda, but obviously, well, if you, if you just state it like that, you're going to say, but an approximate lattice must be an approximate subgroup, so it must be symmetric. Um, so yeah, you have these symmetry issues, but let's say that it's roughly an approximate lattice or, uh, or maybe lambda minus one times lambda itself is going to be an approximate lattice or something. Um, Okay, so this is the question we're going to, to, look at, to look at now in more details. 
And what's really nice with this question is like, if you just look at amenable groups, well, you can, you can kind of generalize it. Uh, you can answer it um, kind of, yeah, in, in the affirmative. Um, but let's let's have a look at um, where our intuition for a proof can, can come from. Um, it would come from actually the theory of, well, finite approximate subgroups and what happens with finite sets and multiplication in finite sets. Um, so, so if you if you just want to 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 keep that in mind for for the next thing, is that the approximate lattices are to discrete subsets what the approximate subgroups are to finite subsets. To the finite approximate subgroups are to finite subsets. Um, it's really the the same kind of relationship. Um, so let's let's look what the theory of finite uh, approximate subgroup says. Um, so it starts quite a quite a while ago and actually quite funnily, uh, roughly at the same time as Mayer's uh, original theorem and Mayer's original study of, of Mayer sets. Um, so the first theorem is, is a theorem, really nice theorem by Plinecker in the 70s. Um, that says that if you have G that is uh, abelian, so you're, you're, you're starting again in the abelian setting, and, um, and you have A that is finite and such that the size of A plus A is not much bigger than the size of A. Uh, then A is a K approximate subgroup. So I do lie a bit here. It's K to the power something, K to the power O1, but let's say it's K approximate subgroup. Uh, so it's really nice. And if you remember the statement of Lagaya's theorem, you can think of Klinecker's theorem as some sort of, let's say, yeah, counterpart of Lagaya's theorem in four finite subsets. And we're going to make that really precise in the next slide. But let's let's keep going and let's let's and try to to look a bit more into this uh, this finite subset. Um, so so after Plinecker, well, actually the, the first proof of Plinecker theorem is is, is uh, quite difficult, and uh, it took a long time before people found found a relatively elementary uh, proof, which is now due to Petridis, I think. Um, so it was in like 2010 or something like that, that they found finally an elementary proof. Um, but anyway, um, so then you have Ruja theorem, uh, which was for us proof 15 years later and escapes the, the, the realm of, of abelian groups. And so you're just, you have your finite set, but it's a non-abelian, well, maybe, well, you don't know if it's abelian or not, uh, subgroup. Um, then you're going to look at the, the, the 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 triple products. So you're going to look at the a1, a2, a3 uh, elements instead of just the a1, a2. And you say that if a3 is smaller than k, uh, is uh, not much bigger than the size of a, then a is a k approximate subgroup. Okay. Um, and then Tao proved like even slightly more. So you don't actually need to look at the whole triple product a3. What you need to, to look at is to say that these sets, the big A, small A, big A, are not much bigger than A in a uniform manner when you, you take all the A's. So it's kind of like you, you're, you're like weakening a bit your assumptions. Um, well, then you have the same assumption. But so, so the question is, in a non-abelian group, what happens when you take just A squared? And that's the next theorem of Tao that, say, that tells you that, well, it's true almost. So if you have A squared, that's not much bigger than A. Well, you're going to be able to find an, a K approximate subgroup contained in A that is a large portion of A. And by large, I just mean that the size of B is, yeah, a, a, at least a fraction of A, uh, where this fraction doesn't depend. On, on the size of B or A, okay? And you can't do better than that. Well, you can't, you can't just like, Plunicus theorem, if you remove the abelian assumption, doesn't hold, and, uh, and they are easy examples. Uh, so Tau's theorem is kind of like the most you can get. Now you can maybe try to get like better quantitative estimates on the CK constants that I have, but that's it. Um, okay, so, so that's the intuition. Can we, what can we do with this intuition? Well, we can just 
we can just use it and we can just uh, get uh, a generalization of, of, of uh, like IS theorem to all amenable groups. So what do I mean by that? Um, so I've just reversed the orders of some things because that's how yeah, I wrote it in, in, in well, I, I was, yeah, used to, I, I usually write it. But um, so I have G amenable, uh, lambda that has finite covolume. Well, now it's written on the right, but it's finite covolume. And lambda lambda minus one is uniformly discrete. So that's the same assumption, just reverse everything if you want to, if you want to go back to what I had said earlier. Then, um, well, lambda is approximately an approximate, uh, or approximately an approximate lattice. Uh, it's, it's an approximate lattice, uh, but this kind of like, sim uh, yeah, uh, approx thing uh, that I've written means that there's something happening just like the last theorem of tau. Uh, the, the one that's on uh, like yeah at the at the bottom line of the page uh, but I'm just not going to to to, to get into the details of that um, okay um, so how do you prove that um, yeah and something fun is that you might start with something that's not compact omega you don't know if it's compact at first it's just finite volume um, okay if g is compactly generated this is a uniform approximate lattice. So while well, this omega can be chosen to be compact. So you get some sort of like additional, uh, additional information too. Um, so how do you prove something like that? Um, we're just going to, I'm just going to sketch it in like two kind of like level of generalities. Uh, the first one is in RD with omega already known to be compact. Okay. So you just have a Delaunay set so basically what I'm redoing there is kind of proving Lagaya's theorem again. Um, but I'm just going to explain how to do it with tools that are, like, that are sufficient to, to, to obtain uh, the theorem in a minimal groups in general. Okay, and I, I'm, I just want to mention a work of Konyeshny. Uh, I, I hope that's how you pronounce his name. Um, that does something similar um, by, well, just there's just a slight difference in the argument that makes it well, yeah, slightly different, but it's the same kind of uh, idea or strategy uh, in RD in uh, in uh, in Euclidean spaces. Okay. Um, okay. So 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 what are we going to do? You want to not only use the finite case as an, as something that provides you an intuition, but you really want to use it as something that's going to provide you information. And so to do that, we're going to try to get from lambda to something that's to some finite subsets. And the best way to do that is just to take Bn, it's the ball center at zero and of radius n, and look at this, the, the finite subsets that are just the intersection of lambda with your balls and imagine it as like intersections that are increasing. So you're going to look at them increasing. So you have lambda that's obtained as kind of like the direct limit of these larger and larger and larger and larger finite subsets. Okay. Um, what you want to show in fact is that lambda n is an approximate subgroup. In fact, a k approximate subgroup with k that doesn't depend on n. And then by an inductive limit argument, you're going to be able to show that lambda is a Meyer set or an approximate lattice. That's, that's the strategy. And it actually works out really well. Um, so since I've supposed that omega is compact upon like rescaling everything, I can always suppose that omega is contained in the ball of radius one. That's, that's really not, not too difficult. And so that what that means is lambda plus B one is equal to RD. Okay. Um, so you want to show that it's an approximate subgroup. So we're going to use Plunicke theorem to try to do that. So what do you need to do? You need to have an estimate of the size of lambda n, like uh, uh, an upper bound of the size of lambda n minus lambda n, and a lower bound of the size of lambda n, so that you can compare the two. Okay, so the first one is really easy. Um, the first one is lambda n minus lambda n uh, is just smaller than the size of lambda minus lambda intersected with the ball of radius 2n. Okay, so you can just check that. And lambda minus lambda is uniformly discrete. So, okay, you have to be a bit more careful than that, but in, essentially in a ball of radius 2n, you have 
Well, since it's uniformly discrete, points are well spread. So the number of points in the ball of radius 2n is essentially the volume of the, of, of the ball of radius 2n, where the volume here, well, I could remove the C and just say that the volume is well chosen. Uh, the volume is just the Lebesgue volume of my ball. Okay. Um, now, so you have the upper, the upper bound for lambda n minus lambda n, and now you'd like a lower bound of the size of lambda n so that you can say that, well, the size of lambda n minus lambda n is not much, um, not much bigger than the size of lambda n. Okay, and so that for that you can you can you can notice that, well, the intersection of lambda with this kind of like ball, it's essentially the ball of radius n plus one, plus your b one contains all of the ball of radius n. Okay. That's, that's just using the fact that uh, lambda plus b1 is equal to rd, okay? And from that, you just obtain really easily that the size of lambda n is, is greater than uh, c prime times the volume of the ball of size n, okay? Then just like that, you've, you've shown that lambda n minus lambda n and lambda n have roughly the same size, okay? And this size is essentially just the volume of a ball of radius n, which is the same of uh, the same as the volume of a ball of radius 2n. Okay, so you obtain this estimate because you have just well a rescaling factor, and just with this inductive limit, you obtain Lagarde's theorem, and so that's that's quite nice. It's a it's a it's a relatively um, nice proof, quite easy to be honest. Uh, once you know Prinikov's theorem. Um, and so that's that's really interesting. Uh, but the next step is what if I didn't start with this uh, initial initial assumption that omega is is relatively compact or omega is compact? What if I started with something that was just like finite volume? What can I say then? Um, well, the first part does not change. You're going to try to apply the same strategy. Okay, you look at the, the, the balls Bn and you look at lambda n, which is equal to lambda in, uh, intersected with Bn. The second part, which is just upper bound on lambda n minus lambda n doesn't change either because lambda minus lambda is still something that is uniformly discrete. So you still have this upper bound. What changes is, is that, I mean, there's no reason for that to happen. You can't, at, you can't really do um, what you've done just before because what you've used before is the fact that omega is bounded and so contained in some B1 or something. Uh, here, omega is finite covolume, yes, but it can be unbounded. And so you can't really do that anymore, or at least it's not completely clear how to do that. Luckily, you have something interesting that happens is that you'd like to believe something like that. That lambda intersected with like some translate of B1 is roughly of the size volume of B1 over volume of omega. Okay, and what do I mean? Well, I mean for some x, let's say at random or generic or typical x, uh, that's just because of the finite covolume assumption. You want you kind of want to believe that. You want to believe that. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so if you can like, reformulate that in a, in a slightly weird way, you'll see something quite interesting happen. Um, and it's just that uh, the intersection of uh, lambda with the ball of radius n plus one is just bigger than this kind of um, interesting um, integral, which is just you, you kind of integrate the above estimate uh, Against against well just the the, the Lebesgue measure and um, over B n. So what you're saying is that I'm going to okay maybe maybe la, maybe lambda intersected with B n might not be true okay but if everything is fine if x is sufficiently typical the intersection of uh, the, the, all these translates is going to be roughly of size vol volume of B1 over the volume of omega. And if you believe that, well, then you, you, you'll believe that the volume of B, this is larger than the volume of Bn over the volume of omega. And you found again what you wanted to find, okay?
So it's for random X again. So there are two things. So you want to prove something like that. You'd like it for it to be true. And you can notice that the, I've written it that way to just like suggest that what we're really looking at are is some pointwise point -wise ergodic theorem on what? Well, what I'm looking at and what I'm integrating against is really these y plus lambda, which are kind of like the set of cosets of lambda. So this set of, of x plus lambda. OK, so that's roughly what I'm doing. And now I need to formalize it because that's exactly how the proof can be can be handled. OK, so that's that's where these notions of cosets, invariant and finite covolume, or other like stronger notions of finite covolume appear. OK, um, so I'm still I'm going to go back to some to some general setup, just define a new thing and then I'll, I'll go back to the proof again. Um, so I have, I, I'm in this really general setup of G, a locally compact group, X, a uniformly discrete subset. Um, and what I'm interested in is in fact, looking at all the closed subsets of my space G. And so that's called the Chabotti space. It's quite well studied, but I guess well studied at the moment by people who do invariant random subgroups, for instance. And so this Chabotti space, um, it's just a set of closed subset of, of G. So it's a massive set. Um, but there's a really interesting topology that you can put on, on top of this set. Um, and this topology is called, well, that's uh, everything is great. It's also called the Chabotti topology. Um, and it's defined, it's a really natural topology and closed subsets. So just to, to talk about convergence of, of sequences, Yn is going to converge towards Y. Um, if and only if, well, the points of Y n converge to the points of Y, and you can see it like on if you if you if you focus on every compact subset of G, you're going to be able to see it happen. Essentially, that's that's what I, I'm trying to to tell you. Um, so you can define it really formally, and it makes uh, C of G the Chabotti space into a compact set, compact matrizable uh, if um, if G is second countable. And uh, the G action, just the natural direction with that consists in like translating your sets, your closed subsets uh, is continuous. So you have a, an interesting dynamical system. And now what, what can you do? Well, you have a, sub, a closed subset lambda in, in your G, uh, which is the lambda we're, we're considering above. Well, you can just look at the orbit of lambda uh, and, and, uh, and look at the closure of this orbit in this topology. And you obtain a really interesting set that has like many names, invariant hull, continuous hull, tiling space. Um, and this set is just like a nice compact G, uh, or compact G space. And so you have a nice topology, um, a nice action and a nice topology. Okay. But so what does this set, what, what is this set in some well, more precisely? Well, if, if you started with a subgroup, what you're really con building is just the one point compactification of your quotient. So you're building something interesting uh, where, well, the extra point at infinity is just the empty set when, when it's con included in. Um, so, so you're building something interesting uh, in terms of ergodic theory. And another way to look at it is that omega lambda is made of all these subsets that cannot be distinguished locally from a translate of X. Okay, so that's what this definition says which is another definition of omega lambda. It says that if I take any compact set, so if I focus on any compact kind of window, the elements of omega lambda are just, well, equal on this compact window to a translate of, X, of oh, let's say that's a lambda, this X is a lambda. Okay, so that's just to tell you that that's an interesting set. Well, yeah, combinatorially, it should be interesting uh, to look at it. If you want to understand the patterns and the patches of your set, it should be interesting. Um, so in this set is actually really interesting. So if we go back to the proof, we want to show this, this kind of estimate, okay? Um, we have this, okay, this, uh, this assumption that lambda plus omega is, is equal to RD. And what's really interesting is that you can show, it's not too difficult, that it, like, well, well, really, um, it implies that you will be able to build 
an invariant uh, Bo Borel probability measure on your omega lambda. Okay, so you have built this 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 odd set of like sort of cosets, uh, and you can now build a measure on it that is invariant and a probability measure. Okay, and you're just like yeah, you just have to be careful with the empty set. So now that I have my invariant Borel probability measure. Uh, the arguments that I had showed with this kind of like pointwise ergodic theorem can just be applied right away to this to this setup, and what you get um, if you apply it to 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 this map, the map that sends y to the number of points in in the ball b one of y. Well, what you get is from the kind of like weird computation I had done above that y intersected with b n is bigger than c prime uh, vol of b n for new almost all y's. So you get something really nice. And the, the C prime depends on Y, but does not depend on N. Okay. So if you if you remember the, the kind of proof strategy, what you've shown really now is that Y minus Y is an approximate lattice for new almost all Y's in omega lambda. And uh, well, that, that tells you that actually lambda minus lambda is an approximate lattice. Um, because you can you can see that the well you can show that the two sets must be related quite strongly, okay. So that's just to to give like obviously it's quite quite quick and um, and that's just good to give an idea of how the proof is. Um, and so yeah, it's quite fun that in the end, well you have these kind of pointwise ergodic theorems that arrive, kind of play or there's a nice interplay with these whole additive combinatorics ideas. Uh, and these counting arguments, and you get like exactly what you want at the end. Um, uh, and if you track down all the quantities in your proof, you can actually uh, you can actually say a lot of quantitative things, that, which which is quite uh, quite always quite nice. Okay. Um, if you're in general amenable groups, you don't have something that's as nice as the balls B n. So you have like fullness sets that can be. Um, that can be a bit tricky to deal with. So the, the, the theorems of Plunecker and Tau cannot be applied directly, but you can just like tweak the, meth the methods so that it is applied to this case and, 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 and it works. Okay, and I have, I think, two more minutes and that's going to be perfect um, because I'm just kind of like stating a theorem and raising a question at the same time. Um, so the question is, can you go beyond the amenable case? Uh, my answer is yes, to some extent, or most probably, uh, and that's because of the next theorem. So you look at something in SLNR, so you're now you're in like this higher rank, simple Lie group setting, which is like quite fancy and everything. Um, and you, you use this assumption, so lambda, small lambda, big lambda is uniformly discrete for lambda, blah, blah, blah. It should remind you, if you remember, uh, that uh, of Tau's theorem, one of uh, Tau's theorem. Um, so you, you suppose that they are all uniformly discrete, but kind of all in the same way. Um, and so instead of like just this initial uh, assumption of like finite covolume, I already assume that I have my invariant probability measure on this uh, invariant hull. Uh, just because in SLNR, things can get funky and more complicated. And so it's better to start with this assumption already. Um, well, then just lambda minus one lambda is an approximate lattice. So it's, uh, it just worked perfectly. Um, but the, the, the proof is just, so it, it's, it starts with the same kind of ideas, uh, but it's, it, it relies on the strategy of Margulis arithmeticity theorem. So we, we go to the theory of higher rank lattices and stuff, and it becomes becomes quite interesting. So you first prove what we call a super rigidity, and then you prove some some something to deal with, like the action of of the Galois group of C on your set. Um, just to show that we're still doing kind of the same thing, really quickly, we're still counting something because that's really the heart of the proof. It's really the heart of what this omega lambda is. It's used to count kind of like the patterns or the local patches or the number of points in some ball or stuff like that. And, and the point is you can, you can count two things. First, you can look at the amenable subgroups of SLNR and do exactly the same thing as I, I've done above and like do pointwise theorems and everything. And it gives you that your set lambda is well spread in all directions. 
And second, second you can, well, okay, so this is too much. And uh, second, you can like count some real, like more interesting in terms of uh, ergodic theory things, which are the hitting times of your set omega lambda. So you, what you're going to do, uh, hitting time is just, you're looking at all the elements of G such that send one point to one Borel subset, one point to one given Borel subset. And, and these sets, you can kind of like count how many times they intersect each like neighborhood and it gives you something, some really interesting data on your set. And, and it turns out that you can just like, okay, put that in combination with Zimmer's co-cycle super rigidity and obtain what you want. Um, and so further results, well, if you want, we can discuss that, but I guess, I guess, yeah, it's been an hour, so I should uh, yeah, set you free and uh, yeah, end my talk now. All right, thank you very much for your talk. Are there any questions? So, you, uh, so in the last slide, I think you mentioned that there's some structure theorem for approximate lists. So do you show like what kind of structure theorem do you show? Um, so essentially the structure theorem, so it's essentially the generalized Meyer's theorem. Uh, so you have the same kind of construction where you have like something that comes from like some lattice in higher dimension and you just like project a subset that's cut out of a strip or blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in, so that's, that's the general thing. So that's true in amenable groups. That's true in some simple groups. That's true in linear groups with radical. So that's true quite often. Uh, at least when you're in that kind of like, like linear groups or like Lie groups setting. I don't know for more general uh, locally compact groups, it seems to be a bit uh, obscure. Um, so you, you show something in like that, but what something quite interesting in, is that in this semi-simple uh, setting, you also generalize uh, Margulis arithmeticity theorem. So essentially what it tells you is that you start from, from, from something that's just an approximate lattice and you manage to show that the so, okay, so you're in a semi-simple group. So essentially you're in a group of, of matrices. And what you manage to show is that the entries of the, of the, of the matrices that are in Lambda uh, all satisfy a really interesting number theoretic condition, which is just they are all piezo numbers or piezo vijari given numbers. Um, so yeah, that's why I, may, I just like briefly mentioned this, uh, this thing at the beginning of the talk. Um, and uh, and yeah, well, so the methods are all like, yeah, quite, at the moment, they're all quite ad hoc. So method for minimal groups are really specific to minimal groups. Ones for semi-simple groups are specific to semi-simple groups and same for the linear groups with radicals. I see. So there's no like a yeah, general thing. I see, okay. I mean, it's, at, some, at some point of time, uh, like I was looking at something called asymptotic approximate groups and uh, Maybe I will email you. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Are there any other questions? That does not seem to be the case. So thank you again.